HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. I don't know what I was thinking when we named our dog Kitty. And this sweetie's become a true family member. So when we vacation, she comes too. That's why we love Red Roof. Not only are they pet friendly, You also get a great price on clean, comfortable rooms so you wake up rested and ready to hit the road again. And this summer, when we rest and repeat at Red Roof, staying two separate times can earn us a free night. Isn't that right, kitty? (coughs) Book at redroof.com. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. You can get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Over the past, um, I will say, two years, um, this podcast has been gaining recognition as a great resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and salespeople. Everything from MSNBC's Your Business to Inc.com to Fit Small Business, uh, Proven, there's a whole bunch of sites where Accelerate Your Business Growth is on the list of the best podcasts to listen to. And we're pretty excited about that. We keep uh, hoping to get on more. Uh, and we know it's you know, due in large part to the wonderful guests that we get on this podcast. These are folks who give of their time and their expertise to share their information with all of you. So you can take what you need and do better things in your business. Today is no different. Today my guest is Steve McKee. Steve is the president of McKee Wallwork and Company, Advertising Ages 2015 Southwest U.S. Small Agency of the Year. He's the author of When Growth Stalls, How It Happens, Why You're Stuck, and What to Do About It, and an award-winning business book now published in four languages, and Power Branding, Leveraging the Success of the World's Best Brands, just published in China. A marketing strategist for nearly 30 years, Steve has held executive positions at notable international agencies, including N.W. Ayer, Della Femina, and a division of McCann Erickson Worldwide. 
He was a popular BusinessWeek.com columnist for more than a decade and currently writes a column for Smart Brief on Leadership. He has been published and quoted in the New York Times, USA Today, Forbes.com, and Investors Business Daily, among others, and he's appeared on CNBC, ESPN2, uh, CNN, FN, Bloomberg Television and Radio, and Network TV affil affiliates across America. Easy for me to say. Uh, so we are truly honored uh, to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Uh, this is such a um, great topic, uh, you know, when growth stalls, because so many business owners, uh, you know, and I think no matter really the, the size or the industry, end up um, at a place where they're coasting, you know, where all of a sudden they're just really not growing anymore. And I'm really curious, if was there an experience or experiences that drove you to start researching this? Yeah, it was, it was just that. We, um, we, we were, we've been around for 20 years, and, and uh, after we were in business for five years, we had very rapid growth, patted ourselves on the back for it, of course, and we made the Inc. 500 list um, back when it was the Inc. 500, not the Inc. 5000, which was quite an accomplishment, fastest growing private companies in America. And um, just after we made the list, between the time we were notified and the time that we went to collect our award, which was a several-month period, our growth stalled. And uh, we didn't know why. There wasn't like an obvious reason. The economy wasn't doing badly and we didn't have a new competitor and those sorts of things. And to make a long story very short, that was uh, the beginning of almost two years of drift where we, as a professional services firm, lost more than nine out of 10 of our staff. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I tell the story, you know that feeling you get when one of your valued employees comes into your office and closes the door. <laughs> I had that feeling about once every two or three weeks. And, you know, when, when you're adrift like we were, it's not as simple as saying, all right, we're going to replace this person. So you quietly leave the position unfilled. And you know what? That's not so quiet. The rest of the staff notices. Uh, so we were, um, we, were, we were in a pickle. We didn't know what to do. And so the only thing we knew to do since we're in the marketing business and we do a lot of market research for a living is we said, well, we made the Inc. 500 list, rightly or wrongly, we're on it, and it had been around for 20 years at that point, so there were several thousand companies that had made it, and we thought, let's do some research. And we didn't know what we were looking for, um, but we could get the list of companies, so we, we scrounged up all the cash we could, which wasn't easy to do, you know, when, you're, yeah. when growth stalls, it's kind of a scary thing, and we hired a wonderful uh, market research firm that we've since worked with a lot, uh, based in Dallas, and we commissioned a study of Inc. 500 companies looking for the keys to success. And what we found were the keys to failure, which changed everything. <laughs> Hence yeah. the book, When Growth Stalls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what did the research reveal? Yeah. Uh, you know, you know the, the path of failure, but, you know, what is it? Yeah. So um, it was really interesting because as a professional marketer and researcher, we do a lot of research and, you know, when you do a quantitative study like this, you get these, these five inch thick stacks of data tables back, right? And normally I'm the objective, disinterested third party consultant looking through the stuff, looking for patterns and so forth. Right. In this case, it was, when I was looking at this data, it was like looking into a mirror because it just, it screamed at me. And what, what we found, uh, and, and we can talk in as much detail about any of this as you'd like, is there are seven factors that correlate highly with stalled growth, three of which are external. We call them market tectonics, because like plate tectonics in the geological world, when the earth shakes, it shakes everyone. And those are no surprise. It's the, it's the economy when you, know, when you have a recession, people struggle. It's changing dynamics like new technology or new regulations that catch companies off guard. And it's competition. No surprise. We all have to deal with that all the time. What was surprising was the four internal dynamics that are theoretically completely within a company's control that either take companies down or get them down or put them out of business. And uh, just in a nutshell, the four are lack of alignment among the management team, loss of focus or lack of focus in the marketplace, lack of nerve, fear, and inconsistency. 
And it just so happened that our company was struggling with all four. Wow. And we didn't realize it until we saw the research. And it was remarkable how, you know, when you look in the mirror, you can see what's wrong. And we took steps to address it, turned our company around. Uh, I began speaking on the topic and, and you know, p- people, where's the book? Where's the book? And I finally, I decided to sit down and write the book. So um, it's really a fascinating dynamic that um, affects all companies and sometimes subtly and quietly. It's a deadly killer. It sounds like it. Because you don't see yeah. it coming, do you? You don't. You don't. Um, I was fascinated, um, you know, listen to the podcast. I was listening to the interview with Adam Anderson, the cybersecurity expert. Yeah. And he, he used a really helpful medical metaphor. Um, and we do the same thing. So the, the the way we look at the four internal dynamics is, and I think as as people, as your listeners reflect on their own careers, whether it's happening in their company now or not, as they reflect on their own careers, they'll recognize this. The four internal dynamics, the best analogy I've found is they're like bacteria that uh, they're present in every company all the time. Just like in our bodies, bac- there's bacteria that's trying to kill us present all the time. And health is defined as when your body is successfully defeating the bacteria, right? It's that stasis right. that's, that's health. When your body gets hit with an, a tectonic event, like a blizzard or, you know, high stress moment or something, and your, your immune system gets depressed, the bacteria can arise and they can make you really sick and they can even kill you. Similarly, when companies are doing well, when the growth is still coming in and everybody's still getting their bonuses and those sorts of things, the internal dynamics don't, they may be going on, but they're not really a problem. So people ignore them, neglect them, or don't even see them. But when hit with a tectonic event, when we go into a deep recession, or you get a new competitor, or somebody trumps you with a new, new advance in technology, or the government issues a new regulation, or any number of things, um, it depresses the, co- the corporate immune system. And all of a sudden, these factors can take hold and take over. We see it all the time. And I should, I should underscore, uh, we, did, we did the initial research among Inc. 500 companies. Then when I wrote the book, we did a, another wave of it among all companies in all industries, regardless of size. And what we found was, in an average year, about 13 to 14% of companies stall, which we define as just flat or negative revenue. Over the course of an average decade, 50% of all companies stall. And as you know, the last decade has been anything but average. Yeah. Somewhere around 80 or 90% of all companies have gone backwards for at least a year in the past decade. So this is, it's, it's, it's prevalent. It's really prevalent. And it doesn't matter the industry or no. size or anything. The, the, one, the one factor, the one causal factor is if you have human beings working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone said to me the other day, all my all my problems wear shoes. <laughs> That's a great I should tweet that, but I'll cra- <laughs> That's awesome. I know, I just love see I remember it. I mean I just loved it. It was hysterical. So um I I do uh actually wanna go through some of them. I is explain to me the inconsistency one. Yeah, well, um, inconsistency is when um, it's it's some of these are cause and some of them are effect. Like a lots of focus can either cause you to stall or it can be an effect of your stalling. And, and same with the others. Inconsistency um, is it has the same sort of uh, relationship to corporate growth, but it's usually exacerbated by a company that has stalled. And it's really, it's the hunt for silver bullet solutions. Um, like when we were stalled, you know, we had, we had, we couldn't come to alignment on a, on a strategic focus. So those are the other two issues. And so as a result, we'd come up with an idea and we'd say, okay, let's try that. But it was half-hearted. We didn't invest enough in it and we didn't stick with it for long enough. And so you just try stuff, hoping for a silver bullet solution. Like for instance, w- uh, in the Inc. 500 study, what we found is, this is the useless fact for your next cocktail party. The average ad campaign lasts 2.3 years. So what? Companies that stall change their campaigns much more frequently. Yeah. And companies that are healthy don't. And there's a, you can't prove causality uh, 
but you can prove correlation and for me correlation is enough yeah. that when you're stalled you're casting about for new directions and when you're casting about for new directions you're stalled uh, that, that is that is such a great point i um i find that um, when i have a client who is really you know feeling like they they, they need to get more clients they bounce from one idea to the next when when it comes to either what they're going to offer or how they're going to put it out there. And I always have to say to them, okay, whoa, wait a minute, back up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These things take time. You keep bouncing around. You're not giving anything the energy and that foothold to really get you anywhere. It, it yeah, and in, my, and in my business, that manifests itself often with companies saying, we tried X and it didn't work. And, and, or the, or the analog is somebody will say to me, what, what's, where should I advertise? You know, what's the best place to advertise? What works? And I say, everything works. If it didn't work, it wouldn't exist. If radio advertising didn't work, there would be no radio. If direct mail didn't work, there would be no direct mail and so forth. It's just, it has, it has to be suited to your particular situation for one. And for two, each medium and each marketing objective have, have a different kind of a relationship, but Odds are it's not going to work in 30 days. <laughs> right. Right. Isn't that, isn't that like your favorite thing to hear from somebody? Oh, I tried email marketing. We did it for a month. It just yeah. wasn't working, so we stopped. I was thinking, yeah. well, wait. Yeah. yeah and so you, you, can't, you, can't take, you can't take a Tylenol for pneumonia, you know? Right. Oh, you can try. It just doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Won't yeah. heal you. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly so. So um, I, I get the fear thing. Um, I, I think I'd like you to talk some about that lack of alignment on on strategic objectives because yeah. I think that one is really a virus. I mean, you know, it's a, just a deadly situation in a company. Yes, you're well. You're wise because not only is that the most common problem we see in our consulting it is the most sinister and the most deadly and the reason is it often goes unrecognized and so when a when a management team is misaligned uh, in some cases I mean I was in a meeting with a client first meeting where the management team you know eight or ten or twelve people were sitting around the table and the f-bombs started flying and I thought well this is interesting uh, they clearly have a lack of alignment but at least they're being honest about it most of the time it's a rolling of the eyes or a comment under the breath or a hallway conversation after the meeting. Uh, that's how a lack of alignment manifests itself. And it can go, it, it can one go unrecognized and two, very often we tend to not want to deal with it. So we tend to neglect it or ignore it. But the reason that it's, it's so sinister and the reason we always address it first is because it doesn't matter how good your strategy is. If you're not aligned, it's not going to get executed. It just doesn't matter. So you've got to get that right first. So why do you think people don't want to address it? Because it's, well, um, I, was going to, I was going to say because it's difficult to do, which it is. But, yeah. but even probably more so is they don't know what to do. So if, you know, if, if, if we're sitting around a, a table, and in, in our case we had three partners, we actually ended up losing a partner through this process. If, if you're in disagreement, you may not realize how consequential that disagreement is. That's one thing. Two, you just may simply not know what to do. Uh, uh, and most of the time, management disagreements are disagreements over strategy. And what I say by that, it's really broadly defined, is one person says we should do X, and another person says we should do Y. And that could be anything. That could be how we price our products and services, or where we advertise, or whether we should invest in this new product, or whatever. It could be anything. It's an argument over strategy. And um, good management teams argue over strategy because that's, you know, iron sharpens iron. That's what you're supposed to do. But when you, when you have dug in positions and you can't come to an agreement, yeah. um, uh, there's only two ways to, to get past that. One is through consensus building. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, Martin Luther King talked about a leader is a molder of consensus, right? That we have to come to alignment on this thing. Or as Jeff Bezos says, you can disagree, but you got to commit disagree and commit. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is if you have a iconic or 
slash dictatorial CEO like a Steve Jobs or like a uh, Herb Kelleher at Southwest Airlines or like a Howard Schultz at Starbucks. And I'm not saying they're dictatorial in a bad way, but I'm saying they're so iconic that people follow them. Yeah. So one way of getting alignment is to have a leader that is so strong and so powerful that people follow them. Most companies don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> and most corporate leaders are not that. <laughs> so we must forge alignment on our team. And when there is a lack of alignment, we've got to root it out. And one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to come to a place where if nothing else, we can disagree and commit, but ideally we actually can agree and commit, or somebody is going to get ejected. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Okay. So if, if, at some point, somewhere in there, it takes strong leadership. And not necessarily from an iconic sort of leader, but someone at some point has to say, okay, we're, we're going to fix this. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. We're going to address this. Yeah. So there's, yeah, and, and it's, strong leadership is true, but I, I might, I might phrase it, it takes a wisdom. And oh. there's, there's two, two pieces of wisdom that, that I'd like to share in that regard. One is, comes actually from Patrick Lencioni, who's one of my business heroes. I like to read everything he writes. And he has this phrase he calls, enter the danger. And that's, that, that, that is when you find yourself in that moment where there's dis, disagreement or somebody says something and the normal uh, incentive is to avoid it, mm -hmm. he would say, enter it, enter the danger. So that's what you have to do is you have to confront it. You have to enter the danger. But the second thing is, and this is a piece of wisdom that your listeners can take and run with because we've seen it work over and over and over again. A disagreement over strategy uh, where people are dug in is not going to be solved by more arguing. But if you elevate the conversation to objectives, you can usually come to a place of agreement pretty quickly. And we find that that's a great balloon popper of tension that especially when things are going badly for a company the arguments over strategy get more heated and more intense and more more consequential yeah. because not only is the company at stake but my mortgage might be at stake right so we're only going to get dug in even further but when but when a company is struggling if you can elevate the conversation to objectives like okay let's not talk about the how but let's talk about what do we need to do together yeah. you can usually come to a place of alignment and consensus and then there is a there's a whole methodology of where you go from there, but that's the first place to start. I really like that a lot. And, and as you were talking about it, I was thinking about um, something that I do, what, like when I do strategic planning with clients to say, everything you do has to map with where you're trying to go. So when you make decisions or you're about to say something or, or whatever it is, you know, you ask yourself the question, is this going to serve the business? Is this going to get, get us, you know, where is it we, that we are going? Now you have to have some place that you're going. You have to have something that you're trying to accomplish because it helps then maybe be more open-minded or make some changes in, in decisions that you're making. Because a lot of times I find people make decisions for like the wrong reason. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. a personal thing. It's a belief or a viewpoint or, you know, a pet project or whatever it is. And it's not necessarily what's in the best interest of the entire organization. Yeah. It's very common. Yeah. Very common. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Well, and if we're, if we're misaligned, we may not even really know what the best interests of the organization are. Oh, that's a good point. So then, if, okay, so, so is that then elevating it to objectives? I mean, is that then? Well, sure, because so w one thing is a presumption of goodwill, right? So if, if you're dug in on X and I'm dug in on Y, I think you don't have the best interest of the organizations at heart, obviously, because right. you have a different perspective than me. But if I presume your goodwill, then I think you do, and we're just not communicating or we're seeing it differently. So let's back up. Let's step back and say, okay, what problem are we trying to solve here? Yeah. And that, that's a big piece of it, too, is the presumption of goodwill. If you can't presume goodwill from the other person, you got a different problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so often we think that people who disagree with us are not just incorrect, but they're bad. That's just human nature. I mean, that's the nature of our politics these days, right? Yeah. So right. Um, a wise leader will recognize that, presume goodwill on the part of his or her management team, and operate from that basis. 
maybe even calling that out. Yeah. Wow. Well, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? Well, and that's the thing. It really, the, the health analogy really is true because you can be really healthy for a long period of time and you can still get sick. Right. Because, you know, none, none of us are immune. Um, the, I, 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 um, I got a call years ago from, from Cabela's, the outdoor uh, mm-hmm. company, that was just, they were just killing it. And they called me and they said, we're interested in having you come speak to our management team about your book. And I said, I'm confused. I mean, first of all, I'm delighted. <laughs> but I'm confused because I said, I thought you guys were doing well. And they said, we are. And I went, okay, this is a wise management team. Yeah. They're trying to inoculate themselves against future issues. And that's the exception more than the rule. Most companies wait till they get into a world of trouble. Uh, you know, you can't start eating well when you're sick. I mean, you need to, but you're not going to get unsick. Right. <laughs> You need to eat well and exercise to prevent getting sick. But even with that, there are some things that are just beyond our control. And the next time we're hit with a big recession, um, guess what? We're all going to be in it together again. Right. But you really have to be able to differentiate, right? You have to be able to you have to be able to know that you're healthy. I guess maybe it's having a consciousness about that, that you know that you're healthy and that you're working. It's taking your temperature. Yeah, it's taking your temperature. In our management meetings, um, less so these days because things are better, but particularly during the recession, we were very intentional about calling these four questions up every week. How are we doing on our alignment? How are we doing on our focus? How are we doing on our fear? And are we being consistent? And it's a good way to sort of just kind of take your temperature. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, I'm so loving this conversation. I think this is so valuable for, for folks because a lot of times I think they think that whatever's going on with them is all external and they yes. don't realize, right? They just don't even think that it could be going on internally. No, they do. They do. And see, that was the point. When we were, st- I, I mentioned when we were on our way up, I gave myself too much credit. When we were cratering, I gave myself too much blame. Because I thought this has to be my fault. I'm missing something. I'm missing strategy. I'm not, you know, I'm not capable or what have you. And as it turned out, no, that's not true. And when a when a company is struggling, who's going to worry the most? But the CEO or the owner, right? And the sleepless yeah. nights and the bleary eyes. And um, I, I learned through this process that when you're discouraged, it's really hard to be creative and inventive <laughs> to come out of it. Um, so it, it, it's, it's important to recognize that these are dynamics that happen to the best managed companies. And if you can, if you can keep, it, keep it away from discouraging you, then what better person to solve it but you? Right. Right. Oh, this is great. I have to take a quick sponsor break and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I have some more questions for you. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg both of whom have been guests on this podcast. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Steve McKee about why growth stalls and what to do about it. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me, Steve, um, you, earlier when I, you know, asked you to talk about um, this, you know, lack of alignment, um, and you said that was the thing that you saw most often. Um, I guess my question is, are these, do these things happen like in order or uh, do they all happen in every company? You know, what, what's the story? Right. They don't, um, generally speaking, what we find is the, the, the greater the depth of the stall, the more likely they're all to be happening. Most of the time they happen in concert and it doesn't really matter where you 
start uh, in, if you want to think of it as a vicious cycle, a, a lack of alignment naturally in many ways leads to a lack of focus and a, a lack of focus causes a loss of nerve because you're not really focused. You're not really willing to, you know, double down on anything and a loss of nerve leads to inconsistency, which leads to a lack of alignment. And so you get in this loop, this vicious cycle, and that's this is what ultimately takes companies down. I mean, I, I read the newspaper, I read the business press differently than other people. I read between the lines, and when you see stories of corporate demise, whether it's Circuit City during the recession or Yahoo last year, yeah. uh, you can see one, two, three, or all four factors if you know if 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 you know what you're looking at. It, you know, they're always going to bl- in the in the business press. They're either always going to blame blame you know, external events or, or strategy, or maybe um, uh, a, a rift in the board of directors. In fact, these corporate raiders that come in and and, and try to take control uh, of a company, they're actually intentionally executing a lack of alignment in order to divide the company so that they can seize power. It's fascinating to watch. <laughs> I don't think they would describe it that way, but that's in fact what's happening. That is what's happening. Yeah, sure, sure. But well, but why? I mean, do you know? Do you know why? Well, in their case, they think that there's value to be unlocked either by divesting a division or splitting the company up or what have you. And they may be right or they may be wrong. That's a case by case basis. But what the problem is is in the meantime, they're they're destroying value. So here's a scenario. You are a senior executive at, at a company. Um, your CEO is embattled but has a plan. Uh, a corporate raider comes in and is attacking your CEO publicly and to the rest of the board. You don't know who's going to win, right? You have, a, you have some affection for your CEO probably and belief, but the, but the, the outsider is making some interesting arguments. You don't know who's going to win. You don't know who's going to be your boss. You don't know who you're going to report to. What do you do? You hide under your desk. That's what you do. <laughs> Metaphorically. You don't do anything, and that's why companies drift during this time period. And while those proxy battles are going on and all those big fights are going on, the company itself tends to drift. And if it drifts too long, it'll it'll lose its way. Yeah, and then it's not it valuable is, to anybody. Right, and and I don't think there's an appreciation for this. And take uh, mergers and acquisitions. You know, companies will um, evaluate to the death on a spreadsheet the cost efficiencies they can gain by you know, merging or acquiring or they, they, they'll pencil it out to a penny. They don't factor in culture at all. I know. And when two companies come together, um, unless one company is so much larger than the other and can just kind of force its will, it's just like, you're going to subsume yourself into our culture and that happens. But two merger of equals is always an issue. And the, the, the value that is destroyed by culture clashes is immense. Uh, you know, it's so interesting that you bring that up. That is one of the things that consistently amazes me, that these companies don't stop and think about what is the most, what what is the smoothest and and most effective way to merge these two organizations for the good of the organization, for the good of everybody. There's a reason for that. There's what? a reason for that. And what? it's the same reason it's the reason that they're merging at all. In most cases, mergers and acquisitions are cop outs because companies are trying to generate top line growth or bottom line savings because they don't know what else to do. Uh-huh. And so they they have a focus problem that their company has lost focus or its focus has become um outmoded or what have you. They're having these issues with internal dynamics. And instead of addressing it internally, they're trying to solve it externally by merging or acquiring a company. So they're already operating in an emotionally or in an intellectually, uh, uh, in an intellectual deficit, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So it's natural that they wouldn't think or worry about those culture clashes because they're not, they're not worried about their own internal dynamics. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not saying that they're bad people. It's just oh. that when you, when you don't know, you know, um, Uh, I think Adam mentioned this also. Back in the day, physicians didn't know that if you don't wash your hands, you're going to kill people. They just don't know. 
Uh, and what I'm trying to do is is come out and say, hey, everybody, wash your hands. <laughs> Let's, and and your 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 business will be much more successful. It's remarkable because we work with you know companies all over all over North America on these issues, and they come in and we talk about these things, and then they're applying it specifically to their situation, and they're like ticking the boxes. Yeah, we're dealing with that. We're dealing with that. We're dealing with that. What do we do? And it's that you know once you realize what you're really dealing with, addressing it is is I mean half the battle's already won. Right. You know, if you know that it's that dirty toothbrush that's making you sick, throw out the toothbrush. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so if there's people out there and they're listening to this and they're thinking, Wow, you know, we've stalled and I I, you know, never wasn't really thinking about, you know, internal or whatever. What what do they do? I mean how do they, you know, is there a way that they start the process of turning things around, of creating some sort of a plan to make things yeah. better? Yeah. And I, uh, uh, not, not shilling my book, but it's the second half of the book is all about that. But I can give oh. you, I can give you the Reader's Digest version of it right here. It's, okay. um, it can be difficult to do for yourself, but, but it's really, it's fairly simple. First, as we already talked about, is uh, uh, admitting it, right? Admitting you have a problem. Um, you first elevate the discussion from strategy to objectives. That's the first step. I'll give you four steps. The first step is you elevate the discussion from strategy to objectives and you find new consensus on objectives. Check. Now, second step is not to go back into strategy because you'll just end up in your old fights. The second step is to leave the building, as it were, to look at the marketplace. What's going on out there? What, what's happening with our customers? Why aren't we meeting their needs, or why are other people meeting them better? Or what? You go to the marketplace and you study the the customers. Um, and what's fascinating about that is even warring factions within a company. When you leave the building, and you um, with you know good protocols, and w whether that's if you're a small business, it might be just going and talking to your ten best customers, right? If you're a big company, it could be all kinds of market research. But you exit the building, you get away from the company, and you focus on the customer, and you say. Where are you going? What are your needs? Where's your head at? You try to re-understand that. That will actually lead you, again, if you're people of goodwill, that will lead you back in the building to determine what your strategy should be. That's step three. And then step four is the how, when, and where of executing the strategy. So really, step four is what we do every day, and different companies have different skill levels, but the how, when, and where is what professionals do every day. We're good at it. We're trained. Um, it's the it's the why, who, and the what that you have to solve for first, and that's the construct that I give in power branding is the journalist six, who, what, when, you know, yeah. you have to do it in the proper order. And the proper order is why, who, what, and then how, when, and where. So if we're arguing about how, when, and where, set that aside. Go back to first principles. Why are we here? You know, and that's what you're getting at when you're talking about your objectives or your mission. If you have to go that high. Right. Who's going to who's going to get us there from a customer standpoint and what do we have to do to ring their bell? It could be a new ad campaign, it could be a new product, it could be an entire revamping of our operation. We've seen all the above. So I I'm I'm sort of stuck on the whole customer thing cuz when you were talking about that this thought comes into my head that says if a company is really paying attention to their customers and staying in touch with them and asking them questions and seeing what's going on and finding out how they are and how they're doing and how we're doing with them, can that mitigate, you know, or, or oh, yeah. the work toward not ending up stalling? Oh, sure. Certainly. Um, and I mean, that's best practice discipline. Most companies don't do it. Right. That's best practice discipline. I wouldn't say that it would eliminate stalling, but it would certainly mitigate or, or put it off. Um, because part of it is there's, there's, there's inefficiencies in all this stuff. So customers may not be entirely honest with you. Right. They probably, and we found a lot of this with research, most of the time, we people, we can't even articulate why we make the decisions we do as consumers. So they may not even be able to tell you. 
um, how they're feeling or thinking, or if they're, you know, if they're off, um, exp if they're off dating someone else, they're not going to tell you that, <laughs> you know, if they're thinking, well, I'm going to try. So I've got a, a favorite restaurant that I go to a lot. A new restaurant opens in town and I still go to my favorite restaurant, but not quite as frequently. Mm. Now, if the manager asks me, Hey, we haven't seen you as much. Do you think I'm really going to say, I'm going down the street to your competitor? <laughs> I'm not going to tell him that, right? Uh, because this is not polite. Now, if he's smart and he's out in the marketplace every day, he knows that that new restaurant opened, and right, he's then that's what you're talking about. Yeah, is being out in the. So I'm not talking about just have a focus group with your customers. I'm talking right. about get out into the marketplace. Yeah. And understand what's really going on. Yeah, yeah. Because I think I think people, especially small business owners, I think they get so tunnel vision and they. They're, they're so busy doing, and they think that, well, our customers know what we do. They'll tell us if there's a problem. They'll tell us if they have another need. You know, well, the truth is, no, they won't. No, they won't. And, or, you know, no, they don't. No, they won't. And, um, and, and they're so heads down that they don't see the bus, you know. <laughs> right. right the, the, world, the world continually changes underneath our feet. Right. So you may be safely on the sidewalk one day, and the next day you're in the middle of the street. Exactly. To continue your metaphor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Right. You gotta be paying attention, right? Because this stuff be... is hard. Yeah. You know, as we're talking about, I'm thinking about my own behavior, my own company's behavior. Once you figure out a formula that works, don't you just wish it would keep working? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, it changes yeah. so rapidly. We're dealing with a uh, a client right now that's in an industry that was born and has matured into a state of commoditization within three years. Ooh. Wow. That's crazy. You know, it used to take decades for that to happen. In this yeah. particular industry, it was born three years ago, rapid growth, fat margins, new competitors enter, commoditization. Boom. And that's what they're dealing with right now. They're stalled. Uh, and we're trying to figure out, you know, the strategy. But the first order of business is them not to get on each other's nerves because, well, it was working last year. What are you doing wrong this year? <laughs> right. Nobody's doing anything wrong, and the marketplace changed. Right, right. And it is hard to stay on top of that. I mean, you know, being able to – for me, it feels like that has to be like a conscious, intentional it's, decision. It's that you're constant vigilance. Right? Yeah. All those temperatures Constant are vigilance. not just internally but externally. Yeah, this business stuff is hard. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> just like adulting, as my daughter would Exactly. Say. Adulting is hard, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poor us, I know. Uh, of course, I wouldn't have it any other way. But will you tell my listeners how they can get the book? Because, boy, I, you know, I don't always say this uh, on my podcast, but this is a book. These books. Yeah, know. well, it's. Um, two things. It's really very simple. Um, you can get When Growth Stalls anywhere, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, just type in When Growth Stalls and you can order it there. But I would offer them, you can learn more about the book at our website. And also, we have a 20 question self diagnosis. Oh. That if you're wondering, what we did was we took 20 of the most salient questions out of our research. And we put them together in a self diagnosis. And it's, uh, it, takes you, it takes you 90 seconds to do. And it calculates and provides a little report about what you might be dealing with. And it's just suggestive. It's not scientific. I want to make that clear. But it's what we often recommend is that you take the self-diagnosis for your own benefit. But also have your management team take it and print out your results. It's a little thermometer thing. Go into a conference room, close the door, hold up your sheets of paper, and start a conversation. That's what really matters. And so at McKeeWallwork.com, W-A-L-L-W-O-R-K, McKeeWallwork.com, on the homepage, there's a self-diagnosis link, and uh, I would encourage anybody who's interested to take it. Boy, me too. And I love the idea of then coming together and sitting down and just talking about what those results are, because that can be so enlightening. Yeah, and what we find is that just because if your thermometer is red or green or, you know, shows or different people have different um, outcomes, it doesn't mean there's necessarily something wrong because you may have yeah. interpreted the questions differently, but that's the point. Have a conversation about it. Right. Right. Don't yeah. stress about it. Don't, don't, don't stress right. about it. Have, and you might find points of disagreement and there you go. 
Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah. Wow. That's so great. Gosh, thank you so much for spending time with me. This is really. I love talking about it. (laughs) I know you do. I can tell it's really fabulous. Um, And I want to thank the listeners and our sponsor. Please remember to um, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth. Sign up for the free trial and also get a free audio book when you do. Continue to prosper and be curious, not fearful or out of alignment. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Coming up on 5-Minute News. I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased, and essential world news daily.